Come on now, let's give Jesus a great big round of applause. Our God is awesome, amazing, incredible. And I just want to go back in the worship. Pastor Tim was saying, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I was thinking, let's just switch. I go back and worship team, we going back for a minute and continue that. Wasn't that rich? Yeah. Man, God is amazing. It is so good to be home yeah. and to, amen. And I am so glad to be reacquainted with a lot of my friends, you know, Portillo's, Aurelio's, Giordano's, my boys. I'm home, y'all. I'm home. Woo! No, I'm glad to see you too. You know. <laughs> that Portillo is shocked the cake, man. Woo! That's, that's happening before we leave. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're fasting. We were done a week ago. I am so, that was so insensitive of me. Ken, just know later. No. Sorry, sorry. Y'all good. See, that was your last temptation before you had to dive all the way in. So I came to be God's tool to test you. <laughs> amen. Amen. Well, listen, as we prepare to go into God's word, I just want to give you a brief update on some of the things that's been going on in our life since you left. So you can have a seat in God's house. This is going to be quick because I'm excited about the word God has for us today. But since we were last here, our family has grown larger. And so the first picture you're going to see is of our beautiful granddaughter, uh, Cassidy. That should be coming up. Yeah, she is four years old. Oh, my God. She stole my heart immediately. But then this past December 11th, we added to our family two more family members. And so we got the twins that have come along. I know, oh my God, you can just eat them. This is incredible. God is good. They are adorable. And then we also had another addition to our family as well. Yes. She is my nemesis, my Lex Luthor, my... Anything that you can think of, she is that. But Ange loves her like nobody's business. And so I love like her too. <laughs> Giving a shout out to my amazing wife, Angie Gilmore. <laughs> yeah! Come on, baby. And my wonderful mother-in-law, Mrs. Margaret McDaniel, who made this trip with us. Excited to be here. And you know what? As we prepare to dive into God's word, I, I tell you, I know everybody doesn't do this, but it just helps me for a moment. So as we dive into the scripture, can you just stand for a moment? For me, it's just an a honoring thing. It's not religious for me. It just does something in my mind. Because how many of y'all know that God is holy? And you know, when you enter into his presence with that kind of heart, something miraculous takes place. So this isn't to be religious and put this on you, but this is just for me. Can you do this for me right now? now thank you thank you thank you and and so we're gonna launch into John chapter 4 verse 22 through 26 it's going to be on the screen and this is the amazing story of the woman at the well and and it reads Jesus replied the time is coming ma'am when we will no longer be concerned about whether to worship the father here or in Jerusalem for it is not where we worship that counts but how we worship is our worship spiritual and real do we have the holy spirit's help for god is a spirit and we must have his help to worship as we should the father wants this kind of worship from us but you samaritans this is important hear this you samaritans know so little about him worshiping blindly while we jews know all about him for salvation comes to the world through the Jews. And then the woman said, well, at least I know. She said it with a North St. Louis attitude. Well, at least I know that the Messiah will come, the one they call Christ. And when he does, he will explain everything to us. And this is amazing. 
Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. I want to talk about this thought for the next few moments called Revelation Brings Revival. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the spirit of truth, the spirit of revelation, knowledge. Be loosed in this room right now. Spirit of faith, rise up now in this place. Give us sight to see. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. So a couple of weeks ago, I'm at a funeral, and my cousin is at this funeral, and we're talking about life and catching up because we hadn't seen each other in a while. And he begins to tell me, he says, man, I've been married for five years. I'm like, oh, that's dope. You've been married for five years. That's amazing. And then he starts giving me the details of his wedding. And I'm like, okay. He, you know, they got married on this hill. I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. A hill is crazy. And he said, we didn't have a minister. So one of my boys, my buddies, my partners (laughs) went online got his ordination online so that he can marry us. He noticed the scowl, I mean, look on my face. He says, no, no offense, because he knows what I do for a living. I'm saying, none taken as I'm lying through my teeth. I'm like, so this dude goes online for five minutes to get an ordination that cost me years. This dude, please allow me this moment to vent to you. This dude is filling out a questionnaire when my questionnaire took years to answer. When when for me it wasn't questions on a page, it was questions and moments. Are you going to be offended? Will you let that deter you? Will you let that rob you? Are you faithful to me? You know, anybody that's called to anything, you know our resume reads a little different than somebody jumping online filling out a paper. I'm like, this dude. And it hit me. It's cultural. You know, there are three significant cultural shifts in our uh, modern times. The first one was the agricultural movement. And so we lived off the land. We lived off of the fruit. We lived off of the things that were made and things that, that came out of the ground. We bartered apples for oranges and bananas for all types of stuff. Then we moved into the industrial age where we lived off of the raw materials and cars came from that and some of our great products came for that. But now we live in what's called the information age. And we're in the information age and I love the way my my boy Tim said it last night, you can Google anything. (laughs) And find out in just a moment. And I'm concerned about the church, the Western church that we've now indoctrinated ourselves into the industrial age, that we are comfortable coming to church, getting information. We we can get online and we can find out anything from anywhere when we just Google it and find out that this is what God is and this is what God says. And what we found out is that we, in some cases, have become a church filled with information. We walk out on a Sunday morning feeling encouraged, lifted up, built up. But Monday through Saturday, we live like people that don't know anything. I'm amazed that the person who shouts on Sunday morning and yells on Sunday morning louder than anybody, but I go on their Facebook page and they're talking fear and doubt and and they're they're looking for somebody to give them a pity party. Weren't you the same one that I had? Like, slow worship down. Let her get her praise on. And then Monday morning, I look on her page and I'm like, is this the same person? Because we are cool having information, but we need something deeper. 
I have, I have found that in going from church to church, I've been able to minister in different churches. And it's interesting how the Spirit of God has been categorized in different ways, in different movements. And then what ends up happening is that at the end of the day, people can hear this amazing message and hear this amazing talk in some places. Because some places don't even use sermons anymore. They don't even use messages anymore. I say, today I'm going to give you a talk. I don't want to talk. I can, I can go to Ted for a talk. I came to give something that's going to change me. And what I found is what we see in 2 Timothy where Paul says that the church has a form of godliness, but it denies the power. It, it, some people, it's like you've been walking into the same spot for years, and yet you walk out the same way that you came in. And it's like you know more, you understand more, you feel motivated, you're inspired to get up the next morning. But I'll tell you this, motivation can only go for so long. Inspiration can only take you so far. I need a revelation from God to get get out of where I am to move to where he's getting me. Thank you for all the information that I've learned and I have gained, but information never changed anybody. I need a revelation. See, revelation leads to change lives. Revelation transforms lives. It is, it is interesting that, that information can change my thinking, but doesn't change my being. You realize that you aren't called, or we aren't called human doings. We're called human beings. Because guess what? When revelation comes in, it doesn't just change what I know. It changes who I am. And what we need is we need more of God's revelation to change the things that are going on in our lives and move us to where God wants us to be. Because transformation comes from revelation. It's interesting. I, I love history. And so when I look at the Azusa revival in 1906, I understand that actually there was something significant that took place in 1901 by a man, Charles Parham, who started the Pentecostal movement. So here he is. He started this movement, and the movement is built on the doctrine that there is a second grace, that there is another experience with the baptism of speaking in tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues. And so it's about a couple of years in, he's got some students. And right around 1906, there was this man by the name of William Seymour who got a revelation that what his teacher had been teaching is real. Here's the crazy part. He had a revelation but not the experience yet. So he goes to Los Angeles and he's preaching this new doctrine because it's new at that time. He's preaching it and as he's preaching it, he goes into a church and they invite him to be there for a couple of weeks. Well, the first week that he preaches, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're preaching this, but you haven't experienced it yet. And so what he does is he goes back the next Sunday and the doors are locked. You can't come back. He starts his own meeting. And as he's teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the revelation becomes stronger and stronger. And people are now being saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in other tongues. It is incredible. As a matter of fact, the Holy Ghost broke out so heavily in that place because of this one man's revelation that people were coming from nations and cities in a time where whites and blacks and Hispanics weren't hanging out. Whites, blacks, Hispanics all start coming together why did they come together? Not for information. They came because of a revelation. One man's revelation was able to shift and actually was the catalyst for the Pentecostal movement. And so when I look at this, I'm like, wow, God, the power of revelation. It is, it is incredible to think that this is what can change lives. And I begin to ponder Logos versus Rhema. 
See, logos is the written word. It is your Bible or your iPad or iPhone. Oh, God forgive your Android device. I'm not hating on you. I'm not, not really. Not much. No. God is good. There's a thing called progressive revelation. As you progress in your understanding, you move. That's all right. As some people are offended, remember this is a test. Get over it. Get over it. Get over it. But as we look at this whole idea of logos and rhema, logos is the written word of God. It is what's laid out. Can I tell you, logos tells me this is how I should treat my wife. This is how I should handle my kids. This is how I should love my God. This is how I should live my life. And it's written, and I learned that 80% of anything that you ever need to know is in logos. 80% of everything you need to know is in logos. But there is a 20%. And that 20% is what I like to call the rhema of God. It is the rhema of God where God says, I'm going to take the logos, the written word, give you a rhema word, which is a word for you. Can, I, can you just turn to your neighbor and say, I need a word. See, rhema is when God takes the principles and the practices of the logos and he fashions them and fits them for your situation. See, I can know all the logos in the world. I can quote logos. I can spit logos. I can say all the, I can put logos in a rap. But logos doesn't come real to me until rhema pops in. See, you can tell me how to treat my wife, but when Raymond comes in, he says, listen, your wife rolls roses on Thursday at 5 o'clock. Yes, yes. Right, 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 right. And what I found is this. When we only spend time in Logos and don't allow time for Raymond, we become religious. You know all this word. You can quote it left and right. You'll know it better than pastors and leaders. But we don't see any fruit in your life. It's like head knowledge, but nothing's made it into your heart. So you're just a walking encyclopedia of the Bible. But you're not a living witness of what it really talks about. But see, when Rhema comes in, Revelation comes in, it not only gives you head knowledge, but it goes into my heart, changes who I am. Gives me real-time information. Can I tell you, Rhema is unfair. Because Rhema gives you insider trading information that other people aren't privy to. When you go on that job interview, you listen, you got Rhema operating within you. They're like, wait a minute, how did you know he wanted to hear that? How did you know that was the thing to say in that moment? Listen, let me tell you about my Jesus. When I get Rhema, man, it changes the game. And I want to help you real quick. Logos without Rhema makes you religious. Rhema without Logos makes you weird. Thank you. Have you ever seen weird Christians? I mean, for real. They get on... The Metro. And they get on the Metro speaking in tongues in front of everybody. And I'm like, the Lord gave me a message to give to this bus, about this, this train, yeah, nah. and they're giving the message. And they're like, because they don't have logos, they don't recognize that if they're going to understand the message, it has to be in English. They're not speaking tongues right now. I had a person that told me one day, they were like, hey, I met my husband. I finally met my soulmate. I'm like, dang, that's cool. Y'all have been married for about 19 years. That's amazing that you all still have that kind of love going on. She's like, yeah, God brought her to me. I'm like, after 19 years, that's amazing. She says, oh, no, no, no. 
I'm not talking about my husband. I'm talking about my boyfriend from high school. And then she said, God brought him to me. I'm on the other end of the phone. I'm like, listen, listen, stop. Stop the presses. Hold it up. Let me help you. God's not going to give you somebody that's not your husband as your boo. God's not going to give you somebody else's husband as your boo. So therefore, God did not bring him to you. And that's what happens. People think they have rhema, but when they don't have logos to back up the rhema, they do weird stuff. So if I'm going to operate in true revelation, I must always recognize that every rhema word I get is backed up by the logos that I read. Have to. So we get to the girl at the well or the woman at the well. And as we're at this woman at the well, Jesus has his disciples go off to get him something to eat. He's tired. He gets to this well in Samaria and runs across this woman. And he says to the woman, get me something to drink. Now, please allow me the freedom of my North St. Louis vernacular. He's like, get me something to drink. She's like, huh? Get your own drink. <laughs> and he, he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Baby girl, if you knew who was standing in front of you, you would ask me for a drink. Because the drink that I give you, you'll never be thirsty again. The water that I give never runs dry. And she's like, well, well how are you going to give me something to drink and you don't have anything to draw water with? He's like, listen, when I give you drink, you won't need a pail or a bucket or a rope. My water is living water. And then she's like, okay, 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 all right. I, that's cool. But then she gets into a theological discourse with Jesus. Yeah. She's like, well, this well, because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you even talking to me? We don't even cross paths because Samaritans were half-breeds and they didn't associate with Jews. The Jews didn't associate with them. But here they are in this dialogue and they shouldn't even be talking because of their cultural differences. And then she wants to go theology on Jesus. Well, listen, this well is Jacob's well. Now, we worship here. You all are supposed to worship on the mountain in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was up the hill. She says, this is not your place of worship. You should be over there. And that's when Jesus breaks off and says, when I'm done with this whole thing, it won't be a mountain or a well that you're going to worship at. You're going to have to worship out of something deeper than what you were taught in Sunday school. You're going to have to worship out of something deeper than you learned in your classes on the Torah. I got something that's so deep that when I'm done, the only place that you really going to know how to worship is out of the rhema spirit that God has placed inside every man. And he begins to go through this with her. And she's like, oh, wait a minute. I know this. The Messiah will come called the Christ. And when he does, he will explain everything. Now, the word explain means this. To make an idea, a situation, a problem clear to someone by describing it in more detail or revealing the relevant facts of the ideas. The synonyms are clarify, manifest, make plain, unfold, make clear, or reveal. So she says, when the Messiah comes, he's going to reveal this whole thing to everybody. And Jesus said, I know you weren't expecting this, but I'm that dude. Yeah. The dude you were looking for, I'm him. 
and I'm here to reveal. And I just want to pause and put a bookmark in this moment because one of the things that I've learned in our church continuums is that we are so comfortable with waking up in, on our mornings and saying, I read my devotional today. I got my five minutes in with Jesus. My five-day devotional on how to go deeper in God. My, f- my 15-day devotional on the words of Jesus. Can I help you? When you come to church, when you read a devotional, you're actually living off of my revelation. When Pastor Tim taught last night, and when he began to talk about different aspects of the story that it, with David and Goliath, I'm like, oh, my God, that's revelatory. But you know what? That's his revelation. And his revelation can inspire me into my revelation. But you know what? His revelation alone won't change my life. I say, let me get my devotion in. Well, guess what? Your devotion is somebody else's revelation of what they got in the scripture. What I need is a lens, is a view that is only geared towards me. That when I look at the story, God speaks to me, says something to me, gives me instruction. That's why it's dangerous to say every Sunday, that's my word for the week. You're living on Pastor Jerry's revelation. And then blaming him because your life hasn't moved forward. Because the most time you spend in the word all week is when he reads the scripture of the text that he's about to dive into. You want real life change? You need your own revelation. You need to get into the word of God yourself and say, God, speak to me, show me, guide me, lead me. And just real quick, it's it's a couple of things that I'm going to give you really quick to help you dive into this because I love this part of being a teacher. I don't want to tell you something without telling you how to get it. One of them is this. You're doing it right now, fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer unclogs the, the avenues, the pathways to be able to hear from God and get a revelation. When you go in and fast and you pray, you are now removing the obstacles to hear God clearly. So you're already in that. And guess what? If you haven't di- dove into it all the way, repent right now and dive into it for the next 24 hours. Because God will speak a word in that. The second thing you got to have is a hunger for God's word. You got to be hung hungry for God's word. It's got to be something that you recognize. I want you more than that Portillo's cheeseburger with the chocolate, chocolate shake. I want you more than that deep dish pizza at Giordano's with the, with the, with the sauce. Okay, I'm forgiving. I'm forgetting, man. I'm sorry. I'm y'all in the fast. Help me, Jesus. It's not right. But you got to want him more than that. And the third thing, and I, I believe this with all my heart, is you got to allow God to break you. If I can be real with you, I don't want to hear anybody preach until they've been broken. Because when you haven't been broken, there is still too much of you in what you're saying. When you haven't been broken, there is so much of you that I can't, now it's hard for me to navigate what's God and what's you and what's God and what's you. But see, broken people, broken people, no, I have nothing to offer unless he gives it to me. Broken people understand that God, if you don't speak, there's nothing to be spoken outside of me. Broken people understand that God, the only good thing that comes out of me is you. I am desperate for you. I am longing for you. And when you become broken, God said, I'll speak to you so clear, you'll think I'm standing next to you. So you got to do those things to allow God that place to bring revelation. But as I prepare to land the plane, there are these three things that I got to leave with you that I believe if you want 2020, to be different, you got to start here. The first thing is in understanding revelation. Understand revelation brings manifestation. Yes, sir. 
Revelation brings manifestation. And in 1 Corinthians 12 and 7, it says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the evidence, the spiritual illumination of the Spirit for good and profit. So when you want manifestation of your healing, of your deliverance, of your kids getting right, you need to get a revelation from God on what to do in that situation. I remember, you know, I'm a big fan of Kenneth Copeland. I listen to a lot of his teachings. And, and I remember he was telling the story of his aunt being in the hospital. He was visiting with his mother. And they got a call from the hospital that their aunt was about to die. So as they're there, his mom is scrambling, saying, okay, let's get up. We got to go to the hospital. We got to go to the hospital. Ken is kind of moving around so he can get her there. And then the Holy Spirit says, stop and pray. And he's... He's like, but we got, you know, we got to get to the hospital. We got to go. But the Holy Spirit said, stop and pray. So he gathered his mother and they prayed for his aunt. Because that's what the Holy Spirit said in that moment, revealed to him in that moment. If you want something to change in this moment, stop your activity. Stop your running around. Stop your mental gymnastics. Listen to my voice and do what I say. Stop and pray. I know everything in you is telling you to run. It's telling you to start the car. It's telling you to do whatever. But right now, I'm telling you to stop and pray. And Kenneth stop and he prayed and then they drove to the hospital when they get to the hospital his aunt is sitting up on the side of the bed looking at them here because the Holy Spirit said pray it brought a manifestation into their lives the second thing you got to understand about revelation is this revelation brings restoration that when you get a revelation, I don't care how bad that relationship has been. I don't care how messed up yeah. the things you've walked through. When God gives you a word on what to do, that thing will work. Yeah. I don't care how stupid it looks. Yes. Yes. And here's David, the story of David in 1 Samuel 30 and 8, just really quick. And you know the story in Ziglag. And he had lost everything. And all of his warriors are now mad at him. And they're turning on him. And they're like, David. You got us into this. This is all your fault. And the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. But he did something that was significant also. He said, go give me the ephod. They bring him the ephod. The ephod represents when a king or a priest wants an answer from God. It represents them getting into God's counsel so God can speak to them. And so he says, go get me the ephod. And then he petitions God and he says, God, should I go after them? And God said, go after them and you're going to recover everything that they saw. I want you to understand something significant. David didn't say, go get the Torah. Right. He didn't say, go get the book of the law. He didn't say, go get the Pentateuch. He said, listen, I respect and thankful for the way that you led Moses and you led Joshua. I thank you for the Ten Commandments and the law. But what I need is a right now word. God, go give me the ephod so I can hear from you right now. Because I know the Torah, but right now I need a rhema. And the Bible says that when he pursued him, he recovered everything. Can I help you right now? One word from God will change everything for you. That God will restore that marriage, restore your health, restore your relationship with your kids. He will restore your wealth. All you need is a revelation from his hand. But the last one, and my favorite one, because I have an evangelistic bent to me. Revelation brings revival. And we go back to my story of the woman at the well. And after Jesus and she had had this dialogue, he comes back and he says, go get your husband. 
She said, uh, hmm. I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You've had five of them. And the man you're living with right now, he's not your husband. She says, whoa. You must be the Messiah. You're telling me stuff. I didn't tell you. You don't even know me. And God, he, Jesus revealed him. Number one, he revealed himself to this woman when he wasn't revealing himself to everybody. Number two, he revealed her to her when she didn't even know anybody knew her story but the people in the town. And as she receives this revelation of who Jesus is, she goes back to the city called Sychar. As she walks into the town, now listen, let me help you. This woman had been married five times, now living with her boyfriend. So don't think that her words meant that much to the mayor or the governor or the councilman in that community. Probably when she would normally speak, they'd be like, that's just that, that we gonna keep it Christian. That's just that. <laughs> Who gonna listen to her? But what you don't understand is that Jesus specializes in revealing himself to people that we wouldn't think deserve it. Jesus specializes in revealing himself to the broken, to the disenfranchised, to the cast off, to the lost, to the person that nobody else would even want to spend time with. Jesus looks for those cases and he reveals himself and as he reveals himself, she goes back to town and says, come see a man. Who told me everything about myself? Now remember, she could be a person that nobody listened to. But because of the revelation that, that, that she got, they said, oh no, something's different about her. She is not the same. I don't know what you just did at the well, but whatever you did has changed who you are. And when she came back, the Bible says that they believed in Jesus based on her testimony. A whole city changed with one woman getting a word from God. And then the city goes out and says, listen, we got to see this for ourselves. And it says, now, we not only believe because of your witness, we've seen it ourselves. We have seen it ourselves. And today, I want to just encourage you with this. You could be the revival for Chicago land. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about the whole church. I'm talking about you. You sitting in that seat with your cute self. You sitting in that seat with your broken self. You sitting in that seat with your despised self. You are the one. This one woman changed the game for a whole country. This one woman changed the game. And we are talking about her today because when God gives one person a revelation who runs with that revelation, they have the capacity inside of them to change things in a whole region. You have the greater one living inside of you. And when you understand who you are and walk and who God says you are, you can change anything. What is your house when you got a word from God? What is your marriage when you got a word from God? What is your city when you got a word from God? Today, you need a revelation. You need to spend the time to receive the word that can change everything. As I close, you know, 20 years ago, I had a whole bunch of logos. I knew the word left and right. I was studying it, reading it, but the problem was this. I had the word up here, but I didn't let it get in there. And my logos field self walked away from God. And I remember what it was like to know the word but not have real revelation because I was dependent on everybody else to spoon feed me. And it was two years 
away from God, the misery of that life, then I say, God, here's my life. I've proven to you what I can do with it. Now you take it and do what you want to do with it. And it was in that moment of brokenness that God gave me a revelation. He gave me a vision of three things. He showed me in this vision, my wife, my son Daniel, and he was in a corporate boardroom in a suit showing him successful. And he showed me this building, 10 buildings with a name on it that he had given it to me. And I took that revelation and I got up out of my mess. And based on that revelation, I woke up every day with a new fire, with a new hunger that God... If you could forgive me and change me, who am I not to give you my whole life? And it was in that moment of revelation that I recognized the love of God in a way that I never thought was possible. And not only did that change me, but it changed life for my kids. It changed life for my city because of the things that we're getting to do in my city. And I want to just end this message today and say to you, you are not disqualified. You are not written off by God. God is not done with you. He is not through with you. You're your messes are going to be your greatest message, but you got to get a revelation. Yes. Yes. When he brings it to you, he changes everything. Yeah. Let me pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We come today knowing there's more. We've blown it. We've messed up at times. But God, give us a revelation to hang our life on. That from this moment forward, we are not the same. But that when you show us you and you show us us, that revival will begin in us and then spread to everybody we touch. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.